Okay. Dear chairs and colleagues, uh, today uh, we are in the front line about the Back to Basics online infertility seminar. And we have very, very talented uh, speakers today. They contribute to this very nice basic infertility panel. And, uh, and also, I would like to thank to the Abbott and the Max Serono company for their contributions and for their supports in this web panel. And as I mentioned earlier, it is a basic infertility panel that we are going to emphasize the scientific literature uh, in the light of the basic concepts. So uh, the, the first speaker is the, the Dr. Meryem Ekan. He graduated from the Istanbul Medical Faculty and he, uh, she, uh, excuse me, she finished her residency program also in Istanbul, OBGYN. And now she is working in the Hisar Intercontinental Hospital IVF units and she is going to uh, reveal us an evaluation of an infertile couple. But just before, I would like to remind you that uh, we are going to show a barcode uh, in the meanwhile, and we want to scan this barcode just before the uh, presentation to answer two questions that the Dr. Mariam Ekan will give the answers in her presentation. And we have one minute for each. Uh, just for the reminder, please scan the barcode and we will start later. Thank you for all and uh, have a nice and fruitful uh, online panel. Hello, dear Aydins. Uh, I'm Dr. Maryam from Istanbul Hisar Intercontinental Hospital IVF unit. Today, I want to uh, tell you about the evaluation of the infertile couple, uh, couple and the basic approach. Yes. We, uh, firstly, we have to find out the exact problems, the definition of infertility, types of infertility, risk of infertility, and causes and diagnosis, and uh, at least we have to manage the patients. First, we have to know the definitions. Infertility means a disease characterized by the failure to establish a clinical preg pregnancy after 12 months of regular unprotected sexual intercourse or due to an impairment of a person's capacity to reproduce either as an individual or with his or her partner. Fertility in intervention may be initiated in less than one year based on medical, sexual, reproductive history, age, physical findings, and diagnostic testing. We also know the definitions exactly. The primary in female infertility means a woman who has never been diagnosed with a clinical pregnancy and meets the criteria of being classified as having infertility. Secondary female infertility means a woman unable to establish a clinical pregnancy, but who has previously been diagnosed with a clinical pregnancy. Clinical pregnancy means a pregnancy diagnosed by ultrasonographic visualization of one or more gestational, gestational sac or definitive clinical signs of pregnancy. Fecundability means that the probability of a pregnancy during a single uh, menstrual cycle in a woman with adequate exposure to sperm and no contraception culminating in a live birth. In population-based studies, fecundability is frequently measured as the monthly probability. Fecundity is means clinically defined as the capacity to have a live birth. Yes, we have to evaluate the uh, couples separately, but we have to know that the problem is always have to um, know that the couple problem. Yes, uh, pregnancy is, a, is the result of a chain of events. We know that this is our uh, genital tra tract and woman must release an egg from on, uh, one of her and ovulation should be cut. And the egg must travel uh, through a fallopian tubes. It means that the tubes can be open and uh, working good and uh, the egg must travel through a fallopian tube towards the uterus and 
A man's sperm also must join with here in the tubes and the fertilized egg along the way. And the fertilized egg must then become and attach to the inside of the uterus. All of this system should be work good. So the infertility affects approximately 10 or 15 percent of couples. And the people who are concerned about the fer their fertility should be informed that 90% of couples in the general population will conceive within one year. Half of those do not conceive in the first year will do so in the second year. The cumulative pregnancy uh, rate uh, in the second year is um, uh, 95%. But... Uh, we have to warn the patient after two years sexual, in sexual intercourse with no pregnancy, and we have to evaluate these couples. Couples who have been trying for a long time um, have a poor chance of spontaneous, con spontaneous conception, irrespective of result, test results. <sighs> Never wait in these patients. Uh, so getting good medical history uh, is the main factor. If the patient has previous extensive surgery, exposure to toxic drugs, pelvic radiation, autoimmune disease, strong family history of early menopause, advanced stage of endometriosis, known or suspected uterine disease, if we see uh, these kinds of problems, we never wait one year or two years. And uh, many of our patients also ask us the frequency or timing of sexual intercourse. That's a very uh, frequent question uh, from our uh, patients. Every two or three days optimizes the chains of pregnancy. Yes, if the frequency of intercourse is one time per week, the probability of conception with the, with the six months is uh, 18%, but three times per week, it means that 50%. Uh, the optimal uh, sexual intercourse three times per week is, is the best choice, I think. And also the timing of intercourse in the second question from our uh, patients. When we'll get a sexual intercourse uh, uh, while we, have, we want to get a spontaneous pregnancy. Intercourse just before ovulation maximizes the chance of pregnancy. Sperm survives as long as five days in the female genital tract, and ovum life expectancy is about one day, just one day, if not fertilized. And sperm should be available in the female genital tract at or shortly before the ovulation. So the, infer the fertile interval in each cycle is approximately six days. It includes five days prior to ovulation plus the day of the ovulation. And we also uh, have to evaluate the environmental and the, uh, the other health factors. Uh, we know that the world obesity in all of the world, the obesity is the biggest problem, biggest health problem. And we also evaluate our patients about these kinds of problems. We know that women who have BMI over the 30 should be uh, informed that they are likely to take longer to conceive and will affect the treatment success rate. I also tell my patients, if your scale is high, your IVF resu uh, results, uh, success result is low. This is the scale like that. And many obese women and men, we know that are fertile, but obesity in women is associated with ovulatory dysfunction. We always see our um, high response of polycystic ovary patients. And we know that if they have BMI index is high, the ovulation rate is very low. And reduced ovarian responsive to IVF uh, and RAT success, and uh, alterated to oocytes as well as endometrial functions and lower birth rates. Obese women are also increased risk of developing maternal and fetal complications during pregnancy. 
that's a very uh, important another factor. And also, not, not just in the uh, woman, and also in the man, uh, may be associated with impaired reproductive function. So, lifestyle modification in women and men in the first line treatment for obesity, followed by adjunction medical therapy, of course, uh, uh, maybe we can do another uh, choice. Um, we know that uh, bariatric surgery in women and men is an important adjuvant to lifestyle modification and medical therapy for weight loss. But uh, pregnancy in women should be deferred for one year post-operatively. Co as a conclusion, preconceptional counseling for obese couples should address the reproductive and maternal fetal consequences of obesity. Uh, Low, of course, uh, high BMI index is a problem, but very low BMI index is another problem. Women with BMI less than uh, 19 uh, causes the irregular menstruation and should be counseled to gain weight. Another biggest, biggest problem in all of the world is smoking. We know that strong association between smoking and fertility in both partners affects the success rate of RIT and also spon spontaneous pregnancy. Yes, the smoking and the infertility committee, uh, according to the committee opinion, there is a good evidence that we know smoking in the female is associated with impaired fecundity and increased risk of spontaneous abortion and ectopic pregnancy. We also have to warn all of patients about these problems and these risk factors. And also smoking appears to accelerate the loss of reproductive function and may advance the time of menopause by one to uh, four years. There is a very important uh, another problem in uh, with women. And also there is a good evidence that smoking is negatively associated with RTA outcomes, such, as, such that smokers require nearly twice the number of IVF attempts to conceive as non-smokers. And there is a fair evidence that also men, semen parameters, and the results of sperm function tests are lower in smokers than in non-smokers. The effect are those depends but smoking has not yet been conceived shown to reduce the male fertility. The adverse effect of Tidetram and the passive smoking are now established and there's a good evidence that non-smoke, sorry, non-smokers with excessive exposure to tobacco smoke may have reproductive consequences as great as those observed in smokers. As a conclusion, Accumulated evidence supports the value of taking a preventative approach to infertility by discouraging smoking and helping to eliminate exposure to tobacco smoke in both. What about the alcohol? Moderate alcohol consumption to, uh, during the day probably has no or minimal adverse effect on fertility. Another question from our patients and the, what about the uh, caffeine intake? Female fertility does not appear to be affected by caffeine intake less than two, uh, 200 milligram per day. Wo woman contemplating pregnancy probably can have one or two cups of coffee per day. And we know that the occupation is very important for the IVF uh, and RIT success and the spontaneous pregnancy also success. Foundry workers, agriculturists, exposure to environmental toxicant, um, exactory, benzene, heavy metals is a very important factor for both um, cement and also oocyte quality. And some of the infection like uh, gonorrhea, chlamydia and tuberculosis maybe um, toxoplasma, malaria, schistosomiasis. These are uh, results of the tubal factor and PID, pelvic inflammatory disease, and uh, services. We know that the age of the woman is a very important uh, factor for the IVF success rate because the wild age up 
and all sites getting older and the meiotic disjunction rates increases. So after uh, 40, the infertility rate decreases by 50%, while the risk of miscarriage increases. Yes, another question, the nutrition. All of patients also, RAT out, RAT cycle, always ask us what I have to eat. Uh, there is no strong evidence that dietary variations such as vegetarian diet, low-fat diet, or vitamin D or antioxidant enriched diets improve the fertility. But we also recommended our patient to eat low-fat diet if their BMI index much more than 25. Yes, infertility, as you see, may be a result of one or more male or female factors. And female and male factors are uh, equally responsible for infertility. And 20% of cases, there is a combination of both factors. Evaluating the both partner is essential. Yes, we, we uh, just firstly, we uh, look the female infertility causes. The ovarian factor is the um, first, uh, first much more uh, ovulation factors is the biggest problem. On ovulation or uh, oligo uh, ovulation decreases ovarian reserve, uterine phase defects, uh, the problems. And who health organization classification of the on ovulation? This is, you know, a hypogonadotropic on ovulation, normal gonadotropic, uh, normal estrogenic on ovulation, the PICOS always sees in this class, and hypergonadotropic, hypoestrogenic on ovulation, ovarian failure, and the hi hyperprolactinemic on ovulation. Tubal and the peritoneal factor is second. Uh, the pelvic infection previous to bowel surgery or sterilization, salvingitis, uh, the results of the two bowel factors. And also we have to evaluate the uterine factors. We have to look, examine our patients, hypoplasia, fibroid uterus, endometritis, congenital malformation of the uterus. Vaginal factors, of course, atresia vagina, transfer vaginal septum or septate vagina. But also another important factor is cervical factor. We know that normal mid-cycle, the cervical mucus facilitated the transport of sperm. Congenital malformations or trauma to the cervix because of some of the um, uh, surgery and may result in stenosis and inability of the cervix to reproduce the normal, normal mucus and thereby impairing the fertility. What about the inherited thrombophilia? Does not appear to be related to the infertility. A large prospective study reported no significant association with common thrombophilies, including factor 5 Leiden and lupus anticoagulant, and initiated in vitro fertilization success. Some of the immune factors, like um, antiphospholipid syndrome, may lead to immunological rejection of early pregnancy or placental dam damage. Some of the inflammatory diseases like Choliac may be uh, increase the frequency of reproductive abnormalities, include, inclu including infertility, miscarriage, and intrauterine growth restriction. I'm sorry. Some of the genetic causes, um, the most common anoplades associated with the infertility, the most common is Turner syndrome in women and Klinefelter in men. They are sterile, you know. What about the male infertility? We separated the male infertility three arms. Pretesticular causes, this is the hormonal problems, hyperprolactinemia, hyper or, uh, hypothyroidism, hypotolomic disease like Kalman, pituitary insufficiency, growth hormone deficiency, or receptor defects. Another, uh, another arm is primary testicular defects, cryptorchidism, Klinefelter syndrome like cryptorchidism, 
androgen insensitivity syndromes, 5 alpha dust deficiency, and some myotonic dystrophy. The chiral disorders, varicocele, the large palpable without wild salva maneuver, ex, uh, environmental toxins, drugs, infections like vira, uh, viral or sheets, immunologic disorders, trauma or testicular torsion. Firstly, uh, whenever our patients come to our clinic, firstly, we uh, want a semen analysis. Six versions of own sperm analysis by WHO have since been published, published, including the last version, WHO 6. This is the last version. And appearing in July uh, 2021. And we see this in volume and sperm concentration, total sperm number, total motility, we evaluated progressive motilition, percent, vitality, and the normal morphology. We evaluate according to the WHO 2021 uh, in our clinic. What about workup for infertility? Yes, we evaluate pay our patient and what we will we do. Firstly, history of taking both couples is mo most important things. Perkins of intercourse, menstrual history, surgical history, abdominal or pelvic surgery, or history of weighting, uh, weight chains. Contraception, smoking, alcohol intake, symptoms, uh, galactoria, thyroid symptoms, and also, of course, obstetric history. Physical examination. Yes, we have to make physical examination Blood pressure, pulse, temperature, basic examination is very important for us. And also, we uh, have to know the body mass index, our patients. Head and neck assessment is very essential. Exophthalmy, hyperthyroidism, epicanthus, lower implantation of ears, hairline. It uh, can be a chromosomal abnormalities. And also... Uh, exclude the uh, thyroid gland enlargement, nodules, and thyroid dysfunction. Also, breast evaluation is very essential. Assess the breast development and abnormal masses, secretion, especially galactorate. And also, we have to uh, examine the abdominal evaluation. I have told you before that Exclude some of the malformation. It can uh, indicate a chromosomal abnormalities and other congenital defects. So dermatologic evaluation is very important. We know the assess for the presence of the acne, hirsutism, polycystic ovary syndrome, and uh, congenital late onset congenital adrenal hyperplasia, Cushing syndrome. Uh, these kinds of um, dysfunctional hormonal problems we can see just see the faces, we can see, uh, know these kinds of, or we can suspect these kinds of problems. Yes, of course, the gynecologic examination, speculum examination is the first line exam uh, in the IVF or the gynecologic clinics. Of course, we're getting a pap smear test and for um, cultures for gonorrhea, chlamydia, assess the cervical stenosis and also the manual examination. Uh, the cervix, the establish the direction of cervix, size, position of the uterus, and to exclude the presence of uterine fibroid, adnexial mass, tenderness, pelvic nodules, and of course, the uh, vaginal or uh, septum or vaginal uh, problems. Yes. We have to make a diagnostic test, documentation of normal ovulatory function. We can ask our patients uh, the menstrual um, cycle and start to start. We have to write the menstrual cycle, cycle starting day. And maybe we, of course, we make a test for ovarian reserve test after gynecological examination, of course, a test to rule out tubal occlusion, tubal potency maybe we can say like that, assess the uterine cavity. 
sorry. Diagnostic test, yes. Um, this, the test for ovarian reserve is very important in RAT clinics. Ovarian reserve, very important factor because diminished ovarian reserve can refer to diminished oocyte quality, oocyte quantity, and reproductive potential. No ideal test, of course, assessing the ovarian reserve, but coordination of tests provides the best treatment. In our clinic, AMH test is always using to um, know the ovarian reserve. AMH is a member of transforming growth factor beta family and is expressed preantral and early antral follicles. Gradually decline as the primordial follicle pool declines with age. That's very important. And correlated with the number of oocytes retrieved after stimulation and is the best biomarker for predicting poor and excessive ovarian response. Unlike the other tests, um, measured anytime during the menstrual cycle and minimal intercycle and intracycle variability. And also other important um, evaluation of the ovarian reserve is transvaginal ultrasonography for ovarian antral follicle count. This table is very good. If we count the antral follicle, this is the antral follicles, and uh, in both ovaries, uh, zero, uh, zero to uh, four, very low functional ovarian reserve, it means, and very small number of recruitable follicles, very high risk of poor response to ovarian stimulation and reduced chains of pregnancy. And if it is five to eight antral follicle count, low, function, low functional ovarian reserve or small number of recruitable follicles, it means high risk of poor response to ovarian stimulation. Normal function, yes, what about normal? Nine to 19 uh, expected normal response to ovarian stimulation. If you count the antral follicle much more than 20, high risk of excessive ovarian response and ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Yes, we also use the history self test regularly in our clinic to know the uterus and uterine, to, uh, uterine pathology and also tube patency and the tubal pathology. It's very useful and easy um, evaluating ev evaluation um, test. Yes, in this photograph uh, is a normal uterus and the tubes patency is very good seen. But in this photograph, we see that both of tube are blocked. This is the, another uh, photo. Uh, the right side is hydrosalpex. Yes, another pathology, yes, we can see that the uterine anomaly or sometimes we can see like that some of the Asherman syndrome. Yes, there is a, another photo. Yes, sometimes we can see uterine pathology like septum. We can see these kinds of intrauterine pathology like a myoma, fibrom, or a big size of polyp. Yes, we can see these kinds of pathology and also the uterine shape of T shape. There is a big problem. Yes. And another uh, easy. Uh, workup for investigation suspected tubal or uterine abnormalities, we can use in our clinics hysterosalfingo contrast ultrasonography, but it requires more expertise. Transvaginal scan during which air or yeah, and saline or a solution of D galactose is infused into the uterine cavity and observed to flow along the fallopian tubes. I, I told you before that requires more expertise. Yes, like contrast in the right follow up YouTube, like the transvaginal ultrasound seems like that. 
Yes. We also, we can use the laparoscopy, but we know that th this is an invasive procedure. And we can use to check the pelvic disease, such as endometriosis, tubal patency, sometimes neomectomy, ovarian kistectomy, or ovarian, sometimes drilling. Hysteroscopy is another basic evaluation, uh, the uterine cavity. This is the normal uh, uterine cavity scene. And this is a fibroid, a big fibroid. And we can see and also treat uh, easily. This is a polyp. And also we can see the Asherman syndrome. And we can treat it, septum, and other problems. What about the mans? What we have to, of course, we have to work up fertility, infertility in man. And we have to make physical examination, both couples. And the evaluation will involve reviewing past health and medical history, semen analysis, blood test, hormone profile. If the genetic or chromosomal abnormalities are suspected, of course, the genetic test, sometimes ultrasonography, transrectal ultrasonography, we can, if we suspect the um, uh, blockage or uh, any other problems. And sometimes if something called retrograde ejaculation, we can uh, get post-ejaculatory urine, urine test. And if you see in the semen analysis in azospermy, we can uh, send the andrologist for uh, testicular biopsy. Yes, management, counseling, and waiting, treatment of the causes, ovulation induction, induction artificial insemination, and IVF. Thanks for your attention. Uh, Dr. Meryem Eken, thank you for your nice and educative presentation. You just uh, summarized us that how are we going to deal and diagnose these infertile couples. And uh, obviously we have some questions, but at the end of session, we will have all of these. So now, I am uh, switching to other speaker. He is also one of my friends and very talented colleagues, uh, Dr. Kerem Doğa Seçkin. He just graduated from uh, Ankara University School of Medicine, just like me, and he finished his residency program in Ankara as well. Now he is working in Istanbul. <coughs> Live hospital groups, and he is interested in reproductive surgery and infertility as well. The now I am announcing the topic of the Kerem is the basic infertility treatment modalities based on diagnosis and the ovarian reserve. Thank you. Hello to everyone. Uh, have a good uh, weekend. Uh, First of all, my name is Doğa Seçkin. Uh, I'm studying in uh, Live Hospital in Bari, Istanbul, in Istanbul. Uh, and I will tell you about the basic infertility treatment modalities uh, based on diagnosis and ovarian reserve. And uh, colleagues before me, uh, Dr. Mariam, told very good information uh, for my lecture. So. It's very easy to me uh, to explain you the other things. So, uh, first of all, why we say basic infertility treatment? Because uh, it's going basic. So we have a lot of advances and improvements in IVF, but we are still the pregnancy rates uh, overall uh, 40 and 50 percent of the uh, IVF uh, cycles. So basic treatment uh, is very important, and the basic. Uh, physiology and the uh, basic anatomy and the other things and basic examination are the most important thing for us. So uh, I will tell you about the base diagnosis and ovarian result mostly. So uh, we know, as we know, the fecundity is the uh, li live birth uh, opening the data, uh, menstrual cycle data, unprotected intercourse. And fecundity rates in normal couples is uh, 15 and 20 uh, percent and decreases with the women age. So what we need for pregnancy, uh, we know well a good uterus and an endometrium and a normal tubal function and ovulation, uh, regularly ovulation and a healthy fertile sperm number and luminous morphology. So 
we see the ovulation and the fertilization here and so after the ovulation the fertilized ovum and the base of the fertilization and we are all doing this in IVF treatment so basically it's uh, we have to know these steps very good so uh, what we can see for description description for infertility uh, yeah a regular uh, sexual intercourse two or three times a week and for one year the couples uh, who cannot achieve pregnancy and uh, if the uh, women age under uh, 35 but if it's over 35 six months uh, or male is older uh, it's six months for us so what's the cause of the infertility when we look, uh, look for the percentage of distribution we can see clearly uh, the men and the women uh, have the same size same percentage of the, uh, problems so we can say uh, first of all, uh, male, uh, we, we have some factors like ovulatory disorders for women and tubal factors and uterine factors and uh, for men, male factors. And we cannot clearly say uh, anything with the base diagnosis and we say this uh, couple's unexplained infertility. Uh, first of all, I will start with the male factor. My, uh, my lecture is related to ovarian reserve, but First of all, I will briefly summarize the other factors in the treatment of this, and then I will uh, give you some information about the ovarian reserve. So uh, uh, we know that with this one spermiogram test, we can uh, detect half of the problem. So uh, as we know, sperm concentration and uh, normal morphology and the forward progression is very important for us. But as we know, most important parameter is total motile sperm count. And uh, what's the reason of the male infertility? Uh, we know 42% uh, of the uh, men has worker cell, and this is the, because of the reason of the uh, infertility of males. So uh, what we do in male factor treatment, as we know, the total motile uh, sperm uh, count is five or 10 million, yeah. Uh, we can do IUI, can be uh, applied with gonadotropin. Uh, and uh, when we look, uh, we, if we have a concentration, uh, uh, five million, yeah, five millimeter, uh, we can do IVF and exit treatment because we know that uh, there is no uh, usable effect of uh, IUI in this group, and we can do azospermia uh, case, uh, testicular sperm extraction or micro testicular sperm extraction. Uh, diagnosis of uh, uterine and tubal factor, Dr. Mariam told us uh, clearly say uh, we, we have a first step examination, another one, the transvaginal ultrasound, and we can clearly see the uh, health of pathologies and uterine anomalies with 3D ultrasound. And we can diagnose with uh, the visible hydrocell things with ultrasound, but hysterosalpingography uh, is most important examination for us for the tubal problems, and we can see occult hydrocell things too. So uh, it's very important for us. So the ultrasound factors we can see some malformations, uh, preventing pregnancy, and uh, we can uh, sometimes uh, detect and. Uh, can prevent uh, pregnancy uh, and complete training septum, unicornial uterus, and T shaped uterus. So, we can do some surgical procedure to these pathologies, and uh, with these uh, treatments, we can achieve pregnancies with the uterine anomalies. And we have uh, some factors with endometrial factors, such as myomas, polyps, and endometrial tickets problems. And uh, re related to the endometrial receptivity, uh, we can uh, difficultly uh, detect these problems. So, with uh, tubal factor, in most of the cases are related to endometriosis and PID. And bilateral, if we have bilateral tubal occlusion, IV treatment or tubal surgery can be done. And with the unilateral occlusion, surgery or cycle follow up can be done. 
uh, what we will do with the unexplained infertility, as we see, uh, we spend the treatment, need to pay, uh, we, we need to explain to the patient. First of all, are you right with the gonadotropin? Can, uh, uh, we can recommend to the patients, but we can directly tell the patients and we will talk together and we can do every treatment to this un unexpected virtual patients uh, because of the time uh, we can see and we can discuss it with the uh, couples. So, ovarian is a revelation. Uh, yeah, as you know, age is the most important factor for us for the ovarian reserve and uh, quality, uh, qualitative effects of ovarian reserve in infertility decline with the age and quantitative degradation. So especially after 35 years old, uh, the decline in fertility rates accelerates uh, mostly. So uh, according to the uh, HSRM guideline, uh, or uh, which ovarian resort should be especially considered a woman age over 35 years old, family of history, early menopause, and history of previ uh, previous ovarian surgery, chemotherapy, and uh, the couples are unexplained fertility and uh, poor previous gonadotropin response before treatment. So patients are planned for ART treatment. So we have to uh, consider these patients in this patient's ovarian reserve very much. So ovarian reserve markers, what we uh, have, so we can uh, have the FSH levels, estradiol uh, levels, and follicle counts in the second or third day of menstruation. And MH levels can be evaluated independently uh, uh, of the cycles, the cycle days. So uh, the osteodial levels can help us, but not can say us directly uh, the ovarian reserve, but uh, basal FSH levels if 10 or uh, 12, uh, 20, it's, we know that it's associated with poor ovarian uh, response. Uh, and the conception failures. So we have to be careful in these patients. Uh, and other things, the osteodyne measures, measurements alone is not recommended. And uh, with the FSH levels, if there is an FSH levels high and the dial levels uh, are, are about 60 or uh, 80 uh, picogram per, uh, per milliliter, uh, we can say poor ovarian response may be obtained. So what else we have? The antropolitan count is uh, very important for us, but sometimes we saw two or 10 millimeter follicles, but there is no response with it. We can see it and we can say there's a good antropolitan count in this patient, but the response maybe uh, is not enough for us. So if antropolitan count is three or five, the case of ovarian reserve, but predict, uh, cannot predict the pregnancy failure. And uh, uh, 12 and uh, much more uh, antipolitical counts, if we uh, detect, uh, can be related to PCOS and severe ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome or, or OHSS. So we have to be careful about this. So, uh, what about the AMH levels? So, we know that uh, the uh, AMH levels uh, under one nanogram per milliliter diminish ovarian reserve and response. So uh, if we see one, two, three point five nanogram per milliliter good response in IVF. So we can clearly say that not only AMH and not only uh, antrotrogen counts is enough. So the most important combination is. Uh, antrotrogen count and the AMH levels. So we have some auditory dis disorders. So uh, we can see it uh, 15 or 40% 40, 40 of the infertile women and the menstrual irregularity we can see. So we have a classification of World, World Health uh, Organization, uh, four groups. First of all, I want to say we have to check, need to check prolactin levels because it can be the reason of the ovulatory disorder. So, first of all, uh, we have to uh, know that the prolactin levels is normal. And then we have hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, normal gonadotropic, normal, normal gonadism, and hyper, uh, hypergonadotropic 
hypogonadism, we can see. So, uh, as we say, the classification of uh, ovulatory disorders, we have a frequency, if, uh, we can see most common the group two. So, we are um, always working with this group, then the basic treatment of clonal strut, and I will tell you about it uh, in uh, other slides. So, uh, what's the, yeah, we said the most common cause of the ovulatory disorders, group two, and uh, we we have an anovulation, and we can uh, the diagnose the anovulation with the certain progesterone levels and LH, uh, LH peak uh, monitoring with urinary LH kits. So, uh, basal body temperature monitoring we don't use, and detection of polyterial rupture by ultrasound uh, can be used, but it's not so easy. So, uh, we mostly use the certain progesterone levels and three nanogram per milliliters uh, it can uh, show us the, the ovulation. So uh, in the treatment, uh, losing weight uh, can uh, accelerate the ovulation. So it's very important for us, the exercise and behavioral change in the lifestyle. So these are very important. And the other step is ovulation stimulation. So <clears throat> we can do the ovulation stimulation to the patients the ovulation disorders, hypogonadotropic hypogonadism with the FSH and LH preparation, and if possible, GnRH therapy. And with the normal gonadotropic ovulation disorder, we can see mostly PICO, uh, polycystic ovary syndrome, and unexplained infertility and mild male factor infertility. The aim we have to stimulate the ovaries, but uh, one or two between 16 and 24 millimeter follicle. But the treatment sensation is very important because preventation, if there are more 15 millimeter follicles with the OHSs and the multiple pregnancy. So our aim is, uh, as I said, uh, one or two between 16 and 24 millimeter follicles and control, control uh, over any stimulation in IVF. Uh, our aim is 11 or 14 mature X. So, which drugs we use? Uh, I am uh, telling about the uh, basic uh, treatment. So, uh, the lecture after me, uh, Dr. Pinar will tell you about the uh, ovulation in, uh, in using uh, the drugs uh, much more. And uh, I can say the clone transfer, we use the usual dose as. 50 or uh, 100 milligram per day for five days and starting days three or seven or five or five to nine days of menstruation and we have some side effects as you know nose vomiting is the most uh, uh, side effects that we see in the in our treatment and uh, the chance five or uh, ten percent of three pregnancy so if uh, oriences live programs and a large pivot tumors, uh, we cannot, uh, maybe we cannot appropriate uh, for this treatment. And as you know, as I said, you, uh, we mostly prefer the uh, drugs in this situation. And after five days, we have uh, see the ovulation. So we will check the patients at the uh, 14 days of the menstruation. And uh, we, we widely use letrozole, but we have some. Uh, Problems with it. This is a very good uh, preparation for the ovulation induction. So uh, only monofollicular uh, growth is is can we can achieve uh, in, with this preparat. And uh, live birth rates are higher than clonopin in some uh, studies. And no antiestrogen effect on endometrium. We don't have any side effect for endometrium. So. We don't know clearly the cytogenic effects, so we have some questions with it. So, uh, with the gonadotropines, as I said before, uh, the, uh, the next lecture will be about it. So, I will tell you only the um, only the one or two uh, ovarian uh, or polycystic ovary gonadotropin uh, and the other patients that unexplained important patients. We usually uh, use seven to five or 150 uh, international units per day, and uh, possibility of multiple births, yeah, uh, and 
may not uh, be uh, greater tumors uh, and ovarian cysts, we cannot use these drugs too. So we know this is the ovarian stimulation and this is the ovulation, ovulation induction time, and we can do the II after 36 uh, hours later ovulation induction. So we know we have step up protocols. Uh, mostly we use this this protocol, and uh, we will start with the uh, as I said you this dose, and after that we go after one week if we have no stimulation and no uh, movement in the ovaries and the follicles, we can uh, step uh, up the dose uh, till to 100, uh, one, uh, 110. 13 international units day. So we have step down protocol, but most of mostly uh, we don't prefer this one. Uh, we use 150 dose, and after that, we have uh, at the 10th tenth, uh, tenth day of the menstruation, we have we are going step down protocol like this. So uh, with the diminished ovarian result, our uh, most important uh, patients for us and we are always working and we are always trying to uh, have a, concept, uh, a conception for these patients but uh, as we know AMH levels and anthropogen counts and the FSH levels are uh, like this and two criteria uh, at least uh, maybe uh, the patients have uh, Patients have three quarters of the to two of them. So uh, what we do in these patients, we can do the natural cycle as as we see the basic treatment of infertility. Yeah, so we can uh, with the one follicle patients natural cycle follow up and follicle growth is enough. We can do the maturation injection and then we can uh, do it with uh, sexual intercourse and the, with the IVF treatment. It's related to the patient's age and the uh, the wishes of the patients and our uh, uh, thinking about uh, the study. And the, uh, we can clearly say uh, nothing about it. We can do a uh, nature cycle. And sometimes my stimulation protocols, we can do clomiphene and the logo gonadotropines or latrozole. Uh, plus one of the tropines. So uh, in recent years, as you know, my simulation protocols is very often, you can see uh, very often. So as you see basic treatments, we are going back to the basic treatments. Sometimes we can see about this. Uh, we have long area agonist protocol. Uh, the, uh, Dr. Pinar uh, will tell you about it. Uh, we uh, it can explain uh, the uh, treatment, but I will tell only the day 21. We have daily injection for uh, agonist, and then uh, we have ovarian stimulation at the uh, two or three days of the menstruation. And then, to whom we prefer this long agonist protocol? Protocol patients with a history of prema premature ovulation and endometriosis and endometriosis. This can this can be useful for these patients and follicular corpse term activation. So uh, follicular uh, disadvantages are long duration of injection use, uh, as we know, and rising FSH dose and agonist trigger cannot be made in these patients. So uh, we have antagonist protocol two, and we have two protocol, flexible antagonist and fixed agonist, antagonist protocol. Uh, we, if follicular diameter is, uh, is uh, rates, to do uh, 13 millimeter, we can start, but fix antagonist protocol. We start antagonist fifth days of the stimulation. And the, this is the this, this we can use it for all patients, and mostly we use we prefer it. And disadvantages premature ovulation can be, and asynchronization of follicles in this patient can be. Uh, this is the table and the summarize that I tell you about it. And, the next lecture will explain all the things about this. And we, we use gonadotropin dose and type selection. Those are like this. And we use uh, some preparation FSH only, and, uh, HM, uh, HMG, FSH and plus LH. And uh, recommend FSH is, we can see, highly purified uh, the use. 
and increase for decreasing dot is useless as we know. Uh, we, we know uh, ovulation trigger those and type we, we don't use urinary ACG in base because we don't uh, uh, we cannot uh, uh, reach the prep, this preparation so we have recombinant uh, ACG so we can do the agonist trigger with tetralin uh, and uh, we, we do we do the luteal plus support uh, with the natural progesterone uh, the weight is not so different with the weights of the effectiveness and intramuscular subcutaneously and vaginal gel and micronized vaginal progesterone and we can use the digestone uh, and the starting time is the, the evening of the opal and uh, till to the of days three days uh, after opal and finish days in the fresh transfer but HCG a uh, positivity uh, till till uh, 12 days. And this table is summarized uh, the, the, the things that I tell you about it, fresh embryo transfer and uh, hormonal replacement trans, uh, transfer and a uh, measure cycle and molecular measure cycle. As we see, we put the embryos after the uh, little phase uh, one plus day, uh, uh, according to the base of the embryos. Thank you very much for your uh, consideration and attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Doğa Seçkin. It is a very, very nice, extensive presentation. We have a couple of questions, but you know, uh, we will answer all of these questions just the end of the session. <clears throat> now, we are with uh, Dr. Mohamed El Kayubi. Um, he is a consultant, OBGYN, and assisted reproduction and medical center of Dubai, Gynecology and Fertility Center. He obtained his uh, master's degree, basic medical degree, and master's degree in obstetrics and gynecology from N. Shams University Medical College in Cairo, Egypt. He is a specialist in the field of obstetrics and gynecology since 1986. And uh, he's also the member of the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynecology UK. I know Dr. Mohamed El Kayubi with his very, very nice uh, discussions, especially in the field of infertility. And we thank uh, him very much for his contribution. Uh, Dr. Mohamed El Kayubi, hi, we are glad to see you here. And the field is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Amir Papucci, for the kind invitation and for all my colleagues in Turkey who allow me to share this presentation with them. Uh, uh, I'm going to talk about unexplained fertility, and I will try as much as you can in the coming 20 minutes to simplify the issue as much as I can. I like to talk from the angle of clinical rather than bookish style, so bear with me. I was asked to prepare two questions to you. Um, the first question is, uh, according to the fetal classification, fibroids that most significantly affect the reproductive outcomes could be classified. Which classification? Please do you the choice of the answer before I go to the next question. Okay, I will move to the next question. The next question is that you do have a patient that came to you to your clinic with infertility and then she did hysterosalpingography and they told her this is one blocked fallopian tube. So she has one patent and one blocked fallopian tube. What is your next step for uh, this patient? Would you repeat the hysterosalpingography? Would you recommend laparoscopy? Would you test for chlamydia? Or you advise your patient to go for either? Okay, I will next, I will move. Uh, I don't have anything to declare about this presentation. Now, infertility, explain, uh, infertility, uh, uh, sorry, unexplained infertility is very simple. It's just like couples with uh, frequent intercourse, unpredicted. Uh, they didn't use any kind of contraception for one year and pregnancy didn't happen. 
But in reality, doctors means three things. One is that the woman has patent tube, she's ovulating, and the male has normal sperm. In the real scenario in our life, we see lots of patients with conditions, and we really don't want to, we don't know how to classify them. For example, patient with one ovary, patient with one patent fallopian tube, patient with fibroids or polyps, patient with diminished ovarian reserve, or patient with mild or couple with mild sperm abnormality. Should we consider them unexplained or not? We are going to explore that as well in our presentation. So what are the options? Suppose you're sitting in your clinic and you have a patient coming to you and you suspect this is on or you diagnose this unexplained infertility. So what is the next step? Of course, you can do more tests to try to find uh, a possible cause for the delay of the pregnancy, or you go for some kind of management and the management could be expansive, mean like you say to your patient, look, this is only the chance. Maybe if you try for another three or six months, you will get pregnant or you do some kind of active management. Definitely, when you offer any patient any management, you will put in your mind what is the pregnancy rate with all these alternatives or these modalities that you are going to use, time to pregnancy, cost, safety, as well as patient preferences. If you are going to go down and to try to find a cause of the infertility, you, this is it's, it's not an inclusive list. So you can see there are so many things that you need to look at. But to categorize them, you can say it's some of them is related to the cervix, some of them are related to the uterus, some of them are related to the tubes, ovary and pelvis, or to the man. And from now on, I would advise you, please don't waste your time by doing post coit of test or to try to find about the little phase defects, because in reality, it does not distinguish patient who is infertile for patient who is not infertile, and it's not going to be productive when you do counseling or you reach the, the way, the way I can treat my patient uh, with, uh, with unfertility, unexplained, uh, sorry, un, unexplained infertility. So let's talk about him. Now, this is, is a guideline from American Society of Proactive Medicine in association with American Urologic Association. And I just picked up what is, can be relevant to unexplained infertility and it's two simple messages. Number one is that if you do a sperm analysis and you find that a lots of round cells, please ask your lab to differentiate between is this is a round spermatid or is it white blood cells. And if you're sure of their accuracy on that and there is biospermia, you need to refer that to urologist for treatment. If you have an ultrasound report that's saying to you that the male has varicocele, Please don't rush for doing varicocelectomy. This is need to be palpable clinically before advising your male to go for varicocelectomy to improve the pregnancy rate. What about doing something more advanced functional? What they call sperm DNA fragmentation. DNA fragmentation means like I do have some kind of damage to the sperm uh, DNA, and that can theoretically decrease the possibility of the pregnancy. However, this is a compound statement from the Canadian Society of Ops and Gynae, as well as the American Society of Ops and Gynae, as well as American as as Urologist Association, who are saying to us, don't do it. Don't offer sperm DNA fragmentation, very costly test, and it has no prognostic value, meaning like you may see it with high, and then Pregnancy rate is the same as natural or artificial or IVF or whatever, so it is not recommended. If I'm going today say like that, that means I have to go back to the basic, and the basic thing is doing sperm analysis. We all know that sperm analysis is a very poor prognostic test. It means like you may do it and you say, well, look, this is not, a no this is not normal sperm analysis, and then the wife next week is <laughs> pregnant. This is the reality. So how we are going to read the sperm analysis to help us to, to treat patients with unexplained infertility is a bit tricky. And I'm going to share what I'm doing with you and based on what. There was a publication by David Kozak and his colleague 20 years ago, and it's beautiful a study, to be honest with you. But the conclusion in that study is there. If you do have mild sperm abnormality, and it's only one parameter that's mild, the chance of the pregnancy is much higher than if you have 
two parameters or three parameters as you can see from that graph. So based on that, you can really counsel your patient. If it's only one mass per abnormality, you may consider natural cycle or you may consider IUI, but if it is three, it was decrease of pregnancy of something like over 16%, I think you may consider some kind of treatment or other type than IUI, for example. Now, the second thing is that based on Dickey, and this is very old study, but it's really very good. They're talking about total motile sperm count, and they looked about using intrauterine insemination for four cycles. What is the chance of the pregnancy based on the total motile sperm count? They calculate the total motile sperm count based on the total number of the sperm in the ejaculate multiplied by the progressive motility, the one that moves fast. And if you do it that way, you can have here a prognosis more than 5 million. Well, fourth cycle of IOI, you may achieve something like 43% pregnancy rate, less than 5, as you can see here, achieve the lower chance of pregnancy. So you now have three things you look at to try from the male side to try to um, classify how we are going to treat him or, her, or the couple. The first one is if there is varicocele, palpable varicocele, clinically palpable varicocele, or there is high number of biospermia, I will refer the patient to urologist for the treatment. If other than that, I'm going to look at the sperm analysis and I count it and spermomotile and the number of the mild abnormal results. And based on that, and as I said, I can counsel my patient about should we do expect management IOI or consider treatment for him or refer him for IVF. Now, something that can come, if you're going to offer IOI, people, they ask you, what's the difference? I mean, I'm, I'm doing intercourse. When we do intercourse, we ejaculate something like maybe 20 million, 50 million in the vagina, but what's actually reaching the tube is thousands, it was around the egg is hundred. While if you do IOI, actually you put something like from one to 10 million at the tip of the tube. So actually what you're doing is an increasing the number of the motile sperm around the egg. In other words, you, you increase the chance of the fertilization. Well, there is always this kind of question, should I do double insemination? What does that mean? I do IUI two times on the same cycle. And the answer to that is that not all patients because there is no benefit. If you're talking about unexplained infertility, there is a trend of increasing pregnancy rate. So what I'm doing with my couple, I can do one or two cycles of just one cycle with one IUI. If the third cycle patient is not pregnant, I will counsel them, maybe we should do double IOI on that cycle. But whatever you are going to consider, please take in your mind, very important issue. From the time of the ejaculation till the time the sperm goes inside the uterus of the lady, it should be less than one, one and a half hour, because we do have evidence that that increased the pregnancy rate. Now we go to the lady, and of course we all see polyps inside the uterus, and not not it's something infrequent. We see it. This is a Cochrane systematic review. It's one randomized control trial, so this has to be taken cautiously. But the conclusion is, if you see an endometrial polyp of a size around 1.6 centimeter, please remove it because you increase the possibility of the pregnancy. The questions come to your mind: What if it is less than that? And to be honest with you, uh, I can't answer you because there is no evidence about always or where again is. But myself, in my practice, what I do is if I find a smaller polyp, and I do have a history of long-standing infertility, I do have a history of recurrent implantation failure or recurrent pregnancy loss, I will immediately advise my patient to consider hysteroscopy and remove this polyp. What about fibroids? And this is as well as a common thing that you may see. This is recommendation from Canadian Society of Opsangaini as well as the American Society of Opsangaini, sorry, and as well as the American College of Opsangaini and American Society of Opsangaini, they all saying the same statement. Don't try to do myomectomy for patients without, uh, with fibroid to improve the pregnancy rate because it doesn't, and it may sometimes do harm than get benefit, except if there is 
compromise on the cavity of the uterus. How I know about compromise on the cavity of the uterus? This is a phagoplastic engine, and as you can see here, if I point it out to you, if you look at the drawing on the left side of the screen, you can see that uh, myoma of size of uh, classification zero or one or two are really affecting the cavity of the uterus from inside. And these ones should be removed before we offer any active management for your patient or even be removed patient who trying naturally. For the others, you may consider leaving them till you have further problems that you can say, well, clinically, this is justification to remove this myoma. Now, what about laparoscopy? For patients with unexplained infertility, this is the American Society of Practice Committee recommendation published very recently, and they are saying routine laparoscopy has no place for patients with unexplained infertility unless. What is an unless? Unless six, I do have some suspicious of pelvic pathology. I'm suspecting endometriosis. Patients give me a history of pains, chronic pelvic pain, dyspareunia, and so on. I'm suspecting infection in the pelvis. I have long-standing duration of infertility, particularly with those who do not use contraceptive pills. Any other type of patient, we all rely on doing some kind of test to test the tube. And all of us, or most of us, rely on something called uh, hysterosatangiography. However, I have to say to you that ultrasound with dye tests like HICO C with 2D or 3D are much more accurate and it should be, should be recommended if it is possible to be done. It needs, of course, some kind of skill and training for the people who are going to do the ultrasound and to do that. So I will assume clinical scenario. We did a hysterosatangiography and patient came to me with one patent floppy and tube. What should I do? Should I repeat this, the X-ray or the geography? My answer to that is absolutely no. Number one, the sensitivity is low. The specificity is not that good, not that extremely high. False negative is high, false positive is high. In other words, you are not going to benefit that much from repeating the X-ray, except confusing yourself and your patient. What about laparoscopy? The answer to that is no for, from the clinic appointed to you, because you are not going to change your management about the patient based on your laparoscopic finding in more than 95% of cases. And if you are going to do some kind of laparoscopic treatment, you are going to increase in total the fecundity rate by 1%, 2%. So it's not really a good choice to go on laparoscopy with a costly procedure that that will be all this person. So what we are going to do then, what we should do. Farhan and his colleague in 2007 did this nice study. They, did, they said to us, if the patient has two patent flop in tube and we did ovulation induction intra insemination for three cycles, the pregnancy rate can be 42.6%. If however, we have proximal tubal block, so the tube is plugged very close to the uterus. The chance of the pregnancy dropped to 31%. And if it is mid or distal tubal block, the chance of the pregnancy dropped to 19%. Obviously, this is can help me to counsel my patient. But before I go into do that, I have to talk to share with you a very important study, which is called AMIGO study. I advise you all to read it. It's a very good study published in 2017 in FNS. And you can see here, they're telling us a very important thing. Pregnancy rate is going to be reduced by 35% in patient with positive chlamydia. So if you do recalculate, you can see that the tubal block, one tubal block, the maximum I can achieve a pregnancy rate is 20%. And you need to take that into consideration. So all the patients that are coming to you with one tubal block need to have chlamydia status positive tested. And that is what I'm under, what I want you to do. Like this is what I do. I really look at the x-ray carefully, define where is exactly the block of that tube because that can give me a prognosis and I order chlamydia status to the patient and based on that and can counsel the patient of further management. 
Now, what about if the patient come to me with one artery? And my advice is that please consider this patient is premature ovarian aging. Meaning like if she is 30 years old, consider her at the age of 35. And that can help you to diagnose this patient. This patient, unfortunately, our possibility to have higher FSH is higher, possibility of running the early menopause is higher, and possibility of having aneuploidy is higher. And I believe that it's better to go for IVF as quick as possible. Uh, this is my advice, unless she is really young. Now, so we came to management. Now we finished all the exhausted possibility of doing extra treatment if we want to. Now we do have to come to conclusion. Should we advise the couple to try naturally again for some time, or we should they advise them a kind of active management, for example? And this is, I advise you to go for a website like what you see here from Netherlands. This is a validated tool that will give you what is your, what is the percentage of the pregnancy for your patient in the coming six months, pregnancy, natural pregnancy with the coming six months. Uh, there, one, there's five uh, 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 items that you need to put the computer, but you don't need to do the post coital test. You still, you have a number that will give you what does it mean. And myself, I consider a patient who have 40 or more pregnancy rate, the chance of the pregnancy, natural pregnancy is 40 or more, is a high the quantity or good prognosis patient. Anything below that, that I would consider it low prognosis, and especially the total that low that 20%. And I even try to classify how I'm going to manage my patient. Now, you can say or argue with me from where you got this 40 or 20. This is my own practice, and I'm looking at my own data, and I advise you to do the same. Because you can say, no, I'm going to raise the power to 50, meaning like you are going to increase the active management, and you will decrease the number of, co of conservative management or observation of expectant management. Or if you do that, the opposite, you increase the number of expectant management. You are the one to have to look at what is the result, the end result of your patient and pregnancy rate that can be acceptable to your patient and to yourself with that. But let's say what I'm going to do if I'm going to advise my patient about expected management. Definitely, I have to talk to my patient about things that can increase natural fecundity. And the question is always arising with when I'm going to ovulate doctor to do some kind of intercourse, for example, or something like that. And I'm advising you and myself is to consider cervical score mucus, which is simple and very cheap, and it can be done every day without any hassle for the women. It's just to put your vagina, get a stretchy, stretchy, watery, and clear secretion. The women is, is about to ovulate in one or two days and improving in, in some studies that this is equal to alleged testing or even better. Frequency of intercourse, and this is another thing. Please don't advise the patient to stop having intercourse that's affecting the sperm. As a matter of fact, frequency of intercourse of two to three times or even daily have a significant high pregnancy rate compared to once per week. So don't stop the couple from having intercourse to try to time it. That doesn't work that way. The third thing, and please do ask your patient about using leprechauns because some do using leprechauns and this can affect the natural fecundity. Some of the leprechauns can kill the sperm. So this is general advice it has to be for all your patients, even those who are going to active management. Now, what we should do? Active management or IVF or what's exactly you're doing? You can read this Cochrane Systematic Review published in 2020. And to try to sum it up, they say some people can do active management, they expect a management, some can do ovulation induction, intertransmission, can do IOI or go for IVF. They base this on good prognosis or high fecundity or low fecundity, meaning over 40, lower, lower, lower than 40 or lower than 20 in my calculation. But to make it very simple and straightforward, if you have high fecundity according to your cutoff, it's an expected management. If you have mild sperm abnormality, you can do IOI alone. If other than that, it's low fecundity. It should, you can consider ovulation induction, intratrine insemination, combined together, not IOI alone, or IVF. If you go to the track of IOI, ovulation induction IOI, you need to ask yourself how many. This is a, a study done by Rin Dollars from US uh, and it's published in FNS as well. He randomized 
more than 500 patients with two arms. One is called fast track arm and one is called standard track arm. Standard means six cycle of ablation induction intrauterine insemination, and if the patient is not pregnant, it goes private. The fast track was three cycle of ablation induction intrauterine insemination, and if the patient is not pregnant, to go private. The result is showing that in patient with unexplained infertility, it's less costly and higher clinical pregnancy rate if you do fast tracking, meaning like only three cycle of ovulation induction intratransemination, and then you have to go for IVF. To round all that about, if you have a patient at the age of 35 or and with more than three years uh, infertility duration, it's very likely if you do any calculation or you look at the data of your patient, you find yourself, you better advise your patient to go for IVF because the chance of their pregnancy with any other modality is not going to be high. All of my patients are going to have general advice to improve their natural fecundity. And then if I have short duration of infertility, and especially those with have high fecundity, I would advise them to try for six months and then review them again. However, if this is fail, or I do have proximal tubal block with chlamydia negative, or I have mild endometriosis that have been diagnosed by laparoscopy, especially those who that did ablation for this endometriosis, three cycle of ovulation induction into the transmination can have a very good chance for the pregnancy. If that fails, or I do have patient with decrease of area reserve, one artery or one tube, with mid or distal block or proximal top, but chlamydia is positive or low fecundity, I will advise my patient to go for IVF as a first option. To sum it up, unexplained infertility is difficult, but it's not difficult to manage it based on the results, based on what we can see from our own data. Expectant management should be in our mind when we talk about our patient, but we should have some kind of validated tool like what I showed you on the internet that can help you to make a decision about which way you can go to and which one you can choose. Always never ignore the male. Take them in consideration and it's a very simple thing. As I said, it's only four parameter that we look at and here we are, we can talk to our male about what we should do. Thank you very much for, for listening. Uh, I would like to thank you, Dr. Ekayubi, for his very, very nice and uh, educative presentation. It, uh, his presentation just included very nice tips and tricks for the management of unexplained infertility. Uh, thank you once again. Now we have finished our first session. I would uh, like to thank all of our uh, speakers here right now. I know it's Saturday and everyone one has some duty today <laughs> it's uh, understandable i have a couple of questions so uh, i think all of these questions are uh, for all of our speakers so i would like to request your answers very briefly and shortly please okay the first question is uh, should we measure the anti-mullerian hormone test in any time of a cycle uh, what do you think, Dr. Maryam and Dr. Do? Uh, firstly, of course, um, in our clinic, we uh, evaluate the ovarian reserve test, just AMA and antral follicle count uh, together with them. Uh, but of course, uh, if you see in the uh, transvaginal ultrasound and if you count the antral follicle uh, count and you see that that's normal, of course, you don't need to assess the AMH always, every time. What do you think, Dr. Doha? And also the age is a very important uh, factor. Okay, thank you, thank you. What do you think, Dr. Doha? Yeah, uh, we clearly know that uh, this is an uh, independent day of the cycle, uh, but the, uh, the new studies uh, are confusing us about this, so we have some suspect about it, but uh, we have some... Uh, uh, we, we know, uh, as we know, uh, all of us are uh, doing the tests uh, in terms of cycle and uh, one of the day. Okay, thank you, Dr. Da. Uh, Dr. Ekayubi, what do you think that should we offer ovarian reserve tests to unexplained infertility patients and which test should we offer? And lastly, uh, what 
if she is under oral contraceptive pills, uh, does AMH levels differ? Thank you. Um, that's a very good question. But let's let's divide that. Yeah, uh, there is some some there is some conditions that can lower the AMH, and one of them is using contraceptive pills, of course, or the other one is using patient using, for example, metformin. Uh, for some uh, period of time. So if the patient is on contraceptive pills, you will definitely have a wrong AMH. It's going to be lower than it should. If the patient is obese, AMH is going to be lower than it should. And in that case, you better reside with antipolic count. Uh, AMH can be done any time of the period. Of course, that's not going to affect because it's it's actually looking at the small antipolicals. So that's there all the time and that can be done. However, if you're talking about, about uh, sorry, anthropoic account, if you're talking about anthropoic account itself, we like to see it, we like to do that on the day two or three or four of the period, because we don't like to see a cyst of follicles that's big that can obscure the good number of the follicles that can we see. In unexplained fertility, uh, measuring the AMH or measuring anthropoic account can give you the same uh, prognostic factor. So if you're doing ultrasound anyway, I will advise my colleague to rely on that. Don't cost your patient extra money. And that must be done in all the patients who are going to do, or patient was diagnosed with unexplained infertility, because if you do have a lower uh, ovarian reserve, you cannot just entertain them for another six months or one year expectant management. That doesn't make any sense. You're actually wasting the possibility of the patient to have a proper, proper family. Not only one child, we're thinking about possibly second or third. Hope I answered the question and I didn't talk too long. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Ekayubi. It's a brief uh, explanation. So let's switch to second question. And I would like to Dr. Doa Sechkin, uh, I think he is interested in this question. What should be the first line treatment, especially in unovulatory PCOS patients? Uh, should it be the, the, the drilling? Should it be the clomiphane or should it be the uh, aromatase inhibitors? What do you think that? Your, your voice is just closed. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, yes. As we know, uh, mostly uh, we use clomiphane struts most of the time, but uh, the the last time, uh, recently, uh, we mostly used, widely used, uh, let's resolve. So uh, the monofolicular uh, improvement and the endometrial, uh, musical endometrial uh, uh, things for the let's resolve is uh, very important for us. So uh, the first line, uh, I use the let's resolve. Okay, thank you. Uh, what do you think, Dr. Mary McKenna? Should it be is surgery or clomiphane or letters? Uh, firstly, lifestyle modification is a very important factor. Yes, it's really nice. You're right. <laughs> yes, because the, uh, all of the patients have a, a high BMI index and eating so sugar. <laughs> and uh, that's very important factors. Uh, firstly, we always uh, make a life modification. And then if uh, the BMI index is normal, um, uh, or if she has an um, insulin resistance, I start some of the drugs and also I send uh, him to dietitian. And then um, uh, if everything is okay uh, to start the uh, therapy, medical therapy, uh, I start um, letrozole is uh, better uh, okay. because the side effect is uh, low and, and not so much, just one pills a day and five days. And then I'm uh, also looking for the growing follicles and uh, step by step, I'm controlling the ovarian uh, growing. Okay. Uh, Dr. Ekayubi, do you have any experience about you started clomiphanes once or twice daily and at the end of this uh, medication, you are experiencing that there are no growing follicles, they are still small. Uh, have you ever had uh, adjust or use or stair step treatment protocols such as adding letrozole or increasing the dose in the same cycle? Uh, thank you for the question. Now, I have a, a white hair, so clomiphane citrate was a friend <laughs> for a long period, period of time. 
Okay, let me tell you about the story of Plum Queen Sitre. We have two uh, possible or three possible scenarios. The women will get pregnant, fine. Patient will ovulate but not getting pregnant, and patient will not respond at all. Meaning, like I gave her a convenience trait, and she's not responding. Uh, for the women who are like the scenario third one that you said, we say this is a convenience trait resistance, and we used to overcome convenience trait resistance by either increasing the dose of clonfin citrate, so we can use up to three tablets per day and we don't need to divide them, they can, the woman can take them all together in one go, all right? Or we, keep, we make it longer and instead of five days, we go for seven or eight days, all right, to overcome the resistance. And sometimes we used to use corticosteroids, we used to use cortisone with that to try to overcome. In other words, we try to reduce the androgen to overcome the possibility of the suppression and to this payment. Nowadays, we don't use any of that. We, I, we, I'm, I, I, we don't do like that with clonfin citrate anymore, anymore. If the patient is really obese, I don't think clonfin citrate can work. Either patient take liprazole or open too often. Hope I answered the question. Yeah. And one final question for KUB. Let's start with KUB. Uh, is it better to use uh, gonadotropins instead of oral agents if you are willing to go to insemination cycles in unexplained uh, infertility patients? Uh, another very, very good question. I hope your time will allow me to. Number one, when you do that, you have to take into account something very important. Gonadotropin will achieve you higher pregnancy rate. Letrozol will achieve you lower pregnancy rate in unexplained infertility. But the multiple pregnancy is in the verse. The letrozole achieve lower multiple pregnancy rate, gonadotropin achieve higher multiple pregnancy rate. So if the risk is significant on this patient when it comes to multiple pregnancy rate, I will definitely go for letrozole. If the patient accepts the possible risk of multiple pregnancy and I don't have anything in, in, in her history or examination that say to me, no, 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 try to avoid multiple pregnancy by all means, I will go for gonadotropin if it's possible, and I will lose uh, chronic low dose step up protocol. So, uh, on the day of ov ovulation triggering, you have two 18s and one 17s. What is your uh, what is your rescue protocol, Doctor Caillou? Are you going to aspirate them? Or are you going to trigger them? with taking the risk of the, the multiple pregnancy after the informed consent, and what should we do? Just briefly, thank you. Uh, now, with, when it comes to three, which is really tricky, it's, it's, uh, it's, you have to counsel your patient about the risk of multiple pregnancy, and especially risk of triplets, which is really serious. All right, however, to put it in magnitude, in a correct magnitude, you have to tell me what type of ovulation medication I use, because, for example, at age uh, multiple pregnancy and triplet is much lower in clonfinsa trait or less result than in gonadotropin. But anyway, let's say she used gonadotropin and she has three. Patient has to be counseled thoroughly. And if she accepts the risk, I will go. My cut off four. If it is four, I always cancel or go for IVF, aspirate and cancel. Okay. There is some people, some people talk about let's aspirate two and do IOI. And for me, I don't know, this is increasing the risk and exposing patient to operation. And I don't think it's really fruitful way to do the thing. Uh, thank you very much. And the final question is, we started with clomiphane, 50 milligrams per day for ovulation induction, and the patient just revealed bilateral ovarian cysts. What should be our second dose optimization? What, uh, how, how much dose should we choose? What do you think, Dr. Ekan? I don't understand. What, would you please? The first, uh, the, the firstly, you you choose the fifty milligrams of clomiphene mm -hmm. for ovulation induction, and you are faced with bilateral ovarian cysts, mm -hmm. and you cancel the cycle. What should be the other dose uh, plan, your other treatment plan for the same patient, uh, just uh, in order to prevent the cyst formation? Yes, um, maybe um, we, I can use not oral uh, medication, maybe injection uh, and the low dose injection, I can start the next uh, uh, step. 
next IVF, uh, sorry, uh, ovulation induction product um, cycle. I don't use uh, the oral medication. You want to switch the protocol, okay? Yes, of course. Okay, Doctor Sechkin, what do you prefer? Uh, first of all, uh, I prefer uh, to uh, expression maybe, uh, and then uh, I will change uh, the protocol as Doctor Akin this machine protocol with gonadotropin or doctor gonadotropin we can use. Mm -hmm. Okay, Doctor Akib, what should what will what should we do for in this scenario? Hi. Okay, um, now, what, what we're talking about developing on the cyst, we have to know which, which, where is the timing exactly the cyst developed from the timing of the end of our tablet of uh, clomiphene citrate. And based on that, we can say if we can use clomiphene citrate in the next cycle or not. We all know that clomiphene citrate has two, two, two products, one agonist, one antagonist, and the, uh, the cyst can develop in this clomiphene citrate because of the long duration of action of clomiphene citrate, but we have to know which one we're talking about. Now, if I do have a cyst developing after four or five weeks of my clomiphene citrate, I will not use clomiphene citrate again, I'm likely to end with it. But if this cyst developed with two or three, let's say a week or two weeks, within this, it may be actually volatile, and we need to consider trigger ovulation by HCG and see what's going to happen. If we end with corpus luteum, this wasn't a cyst. This was a follicle, but it's larger than it usual, all right? And in that case, we may use clomiphene straight next cycle, but the lower we can use is 50. <laughs> there is no split for that dose as far as I know. You're right. I hope I answered the question. Yes, yes, we had the answer with you. Okay, uh, I am just closing the session. I would like to thank all of our contributors, speakers, pro Professor Kayubi, uh, Dr. Ekan, Dr. Sechkin for their very, very kind uh, contributions. Hope to see you once again in our upcoming meetings. Thank you for all and have a nice weekend. I am just closing the session. And we are going to start the other session 15 minutes later. Uh, and we are going to start with Professor Pınar Özcan uh, with her topic. And firstly, we are going to show the barcodes again and hope to see you 15 minutes later. Thank you all. Bye-bye.